So um, let me get started. Your threat model is bad and you should feel bad are the exact words that were used by a Google engineer in response to a design vulnerability that we disclosed in Android and it allowed attackers to bypass two-factor authentication. Now, I don't want to talk about this vulnerability or our work there. I just want to talk about this engineer's response. She thought that our threat model was invalid and um, that, you know, we addressed the wrong problem. And, you know, um, uh, other researchers clearly disagreed. So you can see on the on the screen, there's one reaction to said, dude, seriously, right? This, to him, it sounded like the threat model was valid and maybe the Google engineer was wrong and perhaps you should feel bad. And I would not disagree with that, but I don't want to talk about this uh, this vulnerability. Like I said, I want to talk about the threat model. So the Google engineer thought that the threat, uh, threat model was, was bad. And what does it take to make a good threat model? And uh, I want to talk about that in this, presentation because threat models are perhaps the most important component of security engineering because they define what an attacker tries to accomplish and also what an attacker can do therefore what the attacker's capability are and thus what we should try to defend against and what we should not try to defend against and it turns out that we frequently get this wrong because we make these attack uh, uh, these threat models too limited and that is because we make some assumptions about what the attacker will and will not do. And guess what? The attacker doesn't agree with our assumptions. For instance, in the past, we have, you know, made all sorts of assumptions about what attackers will never do. They will never break randomization or moving target defenses. Or they will never infect our smartphones just because they have now compromised our PC, which was actually the issue that the engineer commented on. Or they will never use side channels to break your uh, uh, cryptographic key. They will never tamper with the hardware. They will never be able to, you know, get some secret number and uh, or, or and or close the air gap. Now, uh, we may conversely make assumptions about what the attacker has to do, right? So attackers to get their, you know, malicious payloads executed have to inject their own code or they have to, you know, divert the control flow of a program or maybe in a code reuse attack, a ROP attack, they need some advanced static analysis to find gadgets in a binary or they um, actually to do a code reuse attack, they need at least to break this moving target defense, this randomization of the address space. And it turns out that all of these assumptions on this slide and the previous ones have turned out to be, you know, as attackers became more advanced, uh, fragile and even false. So let us talk about threat models because I think we get them wrong so frequently because there might actually be a fundamental problem. So that's what this uh, talk is going to be about. And it's going to be, you know, uh, certainly in the beginning, it's going to be uh, very accessible, generic, um, and, uh, and and not too technical. And then towards the end, when we uh, start highlighting this, you know, uh, with an example on uh, on uh, um, the blind side attack that we recently published, it will become more technical. Now, many of the slides will be full of hilarious stick figures and um, and goofy uh, text, but you know, every once in a while there may be some nugget of information. And uh, fortunately for you, I've marked these slides explicitly. So keep your eye out for this symbol. And uh, if you see it, you know, wake up briefly and uh, see if there's anything interesting on the slide. So let's talk about threat models and you. For thousands of years, uh, human beings have tried to make sense of the world by means of um, classification and separation of concern. And by classification, I basically mean, you know, that we distinguish different things. There's me, there's you, there's black, there's white, there's, I don't know, a person, woman, man, camera, TV, and these are all different things, as you will agree. So that if in ancient Greece or so, some, you know, quarrelsome youth would happen along and say, you know, it's all just a lot of the same stuff, Aristotle would step in and say, no, it's actually a lot of different stuff. For instance, we have plants and we have animals and the plants can be subdivided into small, medium and large plants and animals can be divided into those with red blood and white blood and the ones with red blood can be further subdivided into those that lay eggs and those that give live birth and the quarrelsome youth would go, oh, because there's nothing to set a quarrelsome youth straight like hard science and undiluted truth. And that's 
Aristotle created a taxonomy of the world and the taxonomy as a scientific method. And we still use this today. For instance, we distinguish between different classes of vulnerabilities and attacks. There's the, uh, the software exploitation on the one hand, and there's the hardware bugs and, and vulnerabilities on the other hand. And the software exploitation, when we're talking about memory errors, for, in for instance, can be further subdivided into spatial memory errors and temporal memory, memory errors. And the hardware vulnerabilities can be subdivided into, I don't know, uh, Spectre and Meltdown and Rowhammer and all sorts of other attacks. And this is really handy because in this way, by you know, um, doing this classification, we can target our defenses at particular subsets of these vulnerabilities. For instance, we can try to address the spatial memory errors, so buffer overflows and so on, without having to worry about all the rest of the complexity that's out there. Or, you know, we may address these uh, class of speculative execution attacks without worrying about, you know, temporal memory errors, for instance. Okay, so that makes it much more tractable. And this separation of concerns, we, we've actually used throughout history, classification, separation of concerns, as a, as a guiding principle for our understanding of the world. Um, for instance, in the Divine Comedy, Dante imagined nine layers of hell, right? And, and because this was a little bit complicated, this was later simplified, and it became the seven-layer OC reference model. And here we have all sorts of layers where each layer needs to be concerned only with that particular task at hand. For instance, in the fourth layer of hell, also known as the transport layer, um, Dante imagined that uh, you know, the sinners would be pushing really heavy boulders towards the center of hell or away from the center of hell, and this is known as TCP. And they could do this and focus on this task, which was complicated enough, without having to worry about the hell below them or the hell above them. In fact, they could offer this boulder pushing as a service to the layer of hell that was above them. So this is all very good and very handy. And in fact, we may argue that these abstractions and perhaps layered abstractions and you know, the way we partition the world are fundamental concepts for our understanding of the world. We need to do this. We need to understand the world by partitioning this and then, you know, uh, abstracting away from the complexity. Because otherwise, you know, we will no longer understand the systems that we build. These systems, the hardware and software systems that we built today are so complicated that we will not be able to understand them fully. Okay, so on the one hand, this is absolutely necessary. On the other hand, so I was sitting down with my PhD student, Eric Bosman, and, um, and he observed that um, these abstractions break down occasionally. And this is a fundamental problem because this is where the vulnerabilities in our world arise. It's in, in these cracks of the abstractions. And I'd like to point out that I believe that this is an important slide, right? So that's where you see the symbol. On the one hand, I would argue that we need these abstractions, and on the other hand, these abstractions are actually causing the problems, right? So we are not aware of you know, some of the vulnerabilities that actually occur in you know, the lower layers of our, uh, of our system that we thought were nicely hidden away. Okay, so let's go back to the example of the OC reference, uh, seven-layer OC reference model. And we have this transport layer where we see these two guys are pushing really heavy boulders and you know they're being whipped by demons. It's really hot. It's really not a cool thing to do. And uh, so to forget their misery and agony, they turn on some tunes because it makes it much easier to work and push heavy boulders while you're listening to uh, K-pop. They turn on the radio and then of course, you know, the neighbors start complaining because they don't like K-pop and they want you to turn it down. And See, what we have here is that what you thought was behavior that was confined to the, just this one layer affects and possibly causes disturbances in the other layers. Okay, and that is unfortunately exactly what is also happening in computer systems. For instance, consider side channels, cache side channels. Here we have um, a computer system that runs on a, on a kernel operating system kernel. We have two processors here, ordinary programs, and one of them is doing something security sensitive, maybe encryption or decryption with a, a secret key. Or maybe the kernel of the operating system is doing something security sensitive, lots of security 
sensitive information there. And the other process that we see here is perhaps a malicious program that tries to steal the secret, secret information. Now, we normally think of these as completely isolated things. There's a separation of concerns because there are impenetrable boundaries between these different entities. There's a kernel user space boundaries based on you know, the classic rings that Multics already pioneered. And between the two programs, there's you know, memory protection. So we can actually consider them isolated. But in reality, of course, they share a lot of resources that potentially may uh, lead to leakage of information. For instance, the best known resource that they share is perhaps the cache, which is um, a small but, uh, but very fast memory that is always used to speed up memory accesses. If a program accesses any data or code whatsoever, it will be put in the cache first. And it turns out that you can use this to leak information. For instance, let's assume that this um, process on the left here is um, you know, processing really secret information. There's a secret key, and it's doing encryption or decryption. Okay. Um, and what we typically do in, in, in cryptography is we you know, go and, uh, through the key one bit at a time, and we do something, that is the red part here, we do something if the bit is uh, equal to zero, and we do something else if the bit is equal to one. Okay, so that's how we, we operate. So the, let's assume that this is done in the, the process on the left or in the kernel, I don't really care. Uh, at the same time, we've said there is a you know, malicious user, malicious program that tries to get the secret key. Now, what happens if the victim program tries to do the encryption or decryption? Well, if the bit uh, of the secret key equals zero, it will do something. And that means that the code that corresponds to do something will appear in the cache at a particular location that is determined by the address of the do something function. Likewise, if the bit is, equals, is equal to one, it will do something else. And that means that the code that, is, that corresponds to that function, do something else, will appear in the cache at a particular location uh, that is determined by the address of that, of that function. Okay. And at the same time, the, um, the attacker is also doing, uh, 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 using code, so accessing green memory in this particular case. And it will just cycle over you know, a large chunk of memory, and this will eat up space in the cache also. And uh, eventually, it will you know, use up all the uh, memory that is you know, originally occupied by the, um, the do something and do something else functions. So now everything is green, and the attacker will simply cycle over these locations and access them and time them. Okay, and um, so it will time them, and it they will all be super fast because these green bars are in the cache. These are cache lines. Now, at some point, the victim process will try to do some encryption, and for that, it will access um, the uh, the secret key one bit at a time. And let's assume that the first bit is a one, so it will do something else. And that means that the program, will, the CPU, will throw out one of these cache lines from the, um, the, the attacker, one of the green ones, and replace that with do something else, with the blue one. OK. That means that when the attacker cycles up these, uh, ma this memory area again, it will find that most of the accesses are super fast because they're in the cache. But then all of a sudden, it realizes, hey, there's one that's very slow, right? And that corresponds to do something else. The one that corresponds to the memory location of do something else is uh, very slow. So it knows that the first bit must have been uh, a one. Okay, and maybe sometime later, it will find that, you know, the, um, the cache line that corresponds, or the cache set that corresponds to, you know, do something. So the red, the red code here, is very slow, and that means that the next bit was a zero. And in this way, we can leak the secret key. Okay, so this is a, a, is a cache side channel, and it means that the attacker, or sorry, that the, um, the uh, uh, application developer needs to be aware of how the cache works. Okay, and that is really unfortunate because what I consider to be the first law of software engineering. Um, is that you know we don't have to worry about all of these things. We have abstractions 
to shield us from all these low-level details and all of this mess, this hell below us. That is, in our CPUs, in our uh, caches, in our libraries, and so on. We don't have to worry about these things because they're nicely hidden behind abstractions and APIs. And uh, we should just be able to build our application, say, you know, a, a blockchain application. But now, it turns out that we do have to worry about these things because we share all of these low-level resources. So now the blockchain developer needs to worry about these things and not just about this, because it also needs to worry. There is um, there's interference in, the, in the, is there a question? Okay, so it's not just uh, the, um, uh, the, the cache that we need to worry about. We also need to worry about maybe memory, right? So it turns out that memory is vulnerable to the row hammer vulnerability, right? So if we have a row hammer uh, attack, uh, the attacker may access the, uh, the memory super aggressively and then flip bits in memory. So now we also need to worry about that. How is this, uh, this memory being used? We need to worry about you know, all of these new speculative slash trans transient execution attacks, such as you know, Spectre, Meltdown, Riddle, Foreshell, and all the others okay, that um, uh, are CPU vulnerabilities. We need to worry about um, you know, operating system functions that may be abused. For instance, uh, memory deduplication is a very useful uh, feature to reduce the physical memory footprint of a system by making sure that if there are you know, multiple pages that are exactly the same in memory in different processes, we only store them in physical memory once, and we both give uh, we get both of these uh, these programs, you know, a, a reference to that same memory page. Okay, so uh, it turns out that this actually can be used to leak information. Also, I'll, I think I'll say a few more words about that later. But it's another vulnerability that we now have to be aware of, and we have to be aware of traditional um, um, memory corruption vulnerabilities, right? So buffer overflows and uh, temporal memory errors. And we have to be aware of physical attacks, right? Where we sit down and uh, you know, measure the, the power consumption, or we maybe try to do a, a power glitching or some other you know, point laser beams at, uh, at our circuits. All of these things are now uh, um, uh, the worry of our, uh, of our you know, application developer. So here we have Aristotle, who is being forced to ponder the meaning and futility of his existence and losing the will to live. Everything that he does may impact um, any of the systems that he interacts with and may have security implications. And the security, therefore, is determined not just by what the uh, application developer does, but how it interacts with all of these super complicated systems that he thought were nicely hidden away behind abstractions. Okay, so the um, the developer is not very very happy and is worried about this. And um, uh, I would argue that what we've been doing in security work, right, security research, security engineering, by and large, has been to try and reestablish, to restore these boundaries between our poor application developer. And you know all of this complexity, all of this hell in which he operates. Okay, and um, you know unfortunately this has not been super successful. And you may even uh, you know question whether it's possible at all. So perhaps it's not even possible because in the end the security is not necessarily just determined by the application developed by the application developer. It's not just determined by you know us getting the operating system secure or the um, you know the uh, 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 the memory corruption attacks out of this world or other things. It, it um, depends on all the the interaction of all of these systems with this application, right? So and that is super complicated. Okay. So I think that's an important observation. And now my. Slides seem to be stuck. Okay, so so I, I would think you know uh, the attackers might just be uh, uh, using any of these things to leak information. It's all just a lot of stuff, essentially. Okay, so important view graph here. I think the security of your solution, your application, depends not only on your code or the code and the environment, but on all possible interactions with your code and everything else. 
And that means, unfortunately, to write secure programs, at the, you know, right now in this, this world, you have to be aware of all of the, you know, ramifications of the interactions between your code and, you know, maybe the, the DRAM chips or the, uh, the cache, or TLB, all sorts of other, you know, aspects that you may not want to hear about, right? So you need to know everything else. And, um, you know, to state this more bluntly, what I think, what uh, I've argued here is that, you know, the abstractions that we've been using, these layered abstractions, are considered harmful. They try, they give this illusion that we no longer have to worry about all these things that are happening in the hell below us, but that's not true. We still have to worry about that, okay? And at the same time, these abstractions are necessary. Okay? So, so that's not a great situation to be in, uh, but it gets worse, right? Because I think what we've um, uh, been doing so far in security research is exactly what Aristotle has been doing. Right? We've been classifying and partitioning this world in different branches, and we've assumed that there are boundaries between these. Right? So we've assumed that these threat models can be treated separately. All of these concerns that we have about software uh, exploitations, speculative execution, row hammer, et cetera, we approach these threat models in isolation. So we try to come up with solutions for each of them in isolation. We try to uh, have mitigations for memory error attacks by means of maybe randomization or moving target defenses. Okay, and for physical attacks, we may try to lock down the hardware. And uh, for the operating system features, maybe we turn off certain operating system features, such as deduplication. And for the, um, uh, the speculative execution attacks, maybe we make it really difficult to be, abuse certain things in speculative execution, such as indirect branches. Um, we may partition the cache so that the attacker and victim no longer share the same cache lines or cache sets or you know, ways. And maybe for um, you know, the vulnerabilities in, in DRAM, the Rohammer vulnerability, maybe we occasionally refresh the memory cells in DRAM to stop the Rohammer problem. Now, all of these things we do as defenses work only if there are actually boundaries between these different classes of vulnerability. But of course, there aren't any. This, these boundaries exist mostly in our heads. In reality, the attacker can use the full spectrum. There are, you know, everything we see out there, outside of the, uh, the scope of this application developer, is just a lot of stuff. And attackers may use anything from anywhere and combine them in any way they see fit. So that's you know another what I consider another important view graph. This notion of treating threat models in isolation is actually it's a mistake because attackers can mix and match mix and match these things to their heart's delight. They are they will not follow your rules. They will mess with everything. Okay. So they combine different threat models, different attack factors in different ways. And I've you know, mentioned three different ways in which you can combine them um, sequentially, concurrently, and, and symbiotically. And I'll give examples of, of those. Maybe you could argue whether concurrently is a separate effort. Um, I think the symbiotic uh, combination of different attack factors is actually very interesting. But let's have a look. So what we're kind of used to is the sequential combination of different attack factors. It's, we're quite accustomed to this. We use one class of attacks, for instance, transient execution attacks, to accomplish the first step, and then follow that by the second step that uh, uses a different attack factors. For instance, in this figure, we see that uh, we use uh, a transient execution attack, a riddle, um, a riddle MDS, to, um, to break address space layout randomization, some moving target defense. And that gives us knowledge of the address space layout that we then can subsequently use in a code reuse attack using one more traditional memory corruption. And that will give us an answer. Okay. In case you're wondering uh, um, what this Riddle and the S vulnerability is, you can you know, ask me after the talk. Um, it's one of these vulnerabilities in the category of uh, Spectre Meltdown for Shadow. It's, I think it's pretty cool. Um, and, and I have some you know, backup slides if you're, uh, you're interested in this. Now, we know all of this, right? This sequential combination of different attack vectors to uh, obtain an end-to-end -end ex uh, exploit 
is something that we've been doing in the past for a long time. Here's another example uh, that we, um, we something that we published actually uh, a couple of years ago. It won one of these uh, these Pony Awards that uh, uh, Julia alluded to, uh, and it was making use of the memory deduplication functionality in Windows 8 and Windows 8.1 and, and Windows 10. Okay, so um, deduplication, memory deduplication, like I meant, as I mentioned, saves physical memory by merging pages of memory if they are the same. Okay, and they store only a single copy, but they store that copy copy on write. Okay, so that because you know you don't want you know, you, you, it's fine if you share the same physical page frame um, in two security domains, but if one of the security domains modifies the content, you don't want this to corrupt the uh, the, the content of the other security domain. Also, okay, so unfortunately, this creates a side channel because an attacker in one of those security domains can determine that uh, a page has been merged, has been deduplicated. And you can detect this because a write now takes longer. On a non-deduplicated page, so a normal page, a, a, a write operation is really fast. You just write to the page. But if a page has been merged, so if it's deduplicated, now it becomes much more complicated because a write, it's a copy on write page, so you have to trap into the kernel and the kernel has to look at it and say, oh, it's copy on write, so we need to you know, make a new fresh copy for this process and uh, we need to update the, uh, the page tables and then we have to go back to user space and then we have to write. All of this takes measurably longer. Now, since you know this, so you can measure that your, um, your page has been deduplicated, you can use this to leak information, right? So it means that if you notice that your page um, takes longer to write to, you know that somebody else has the same content in memory. So you leak something about the content that the uh, the other process has in memory. Of course, this is still very very coarse grain at the level of a page, and it, you know to to make this leak something more uh, substantial, something uh, you know uh, uh, say a smaller secret such as an address. To break address space layout randomization, you need to do all sorts of clever things. And if you're interested in that, I, I would advise you to uh, to have a look at that paper. But that's what we did. We actually used it to break address space layout randomization. Okay. And then we went. Oops. We went from that. Uh, let me just. Back. We went from that, and once we broke address space layout randomization, we had some pointers to data and some pointers to code. We corrupted those pointers to point to things that we control, right? So instead of, you know, in J from JavaScript, we had a JavaScript object, which had a method. We made sure that the pointer to that method was modified to point to something that we wanted to have executed using this row hammer bit flip. And then we have an end-to-end -end export. Okay, so, but like I said, these, uh, the sequential combination of different attack vectors is something that we, we've been doing for years. What is perhaps less common is when we need more than one attack vector to accomplish one thing, right? So, for instance, uh, we recently published a paper where we need two attack vectors, two different attacks, to break down the entropy of kernel address space layout randomization. Um, it's an attack that we describe in our tag bleed paper that is published at Euro S&P 2020. And uh, it breaks kernel address space layout randomization, which has on Linux uh, for the kernel image, nine bits of entropy. So there's nine bits of randomness. And the first seven bits we use, we obtain using an attack um, that abuses modern translation look-aside buffers, TLBs. And the details are clearly beyond this presentation. But essentially, the level two translation look aside buffer, so the level two TLB in, um, in modern Intel processors, is a 12 way set associative cache. And in this TLB, there are 128 cache. And using a side channel, very much like the cache side channels that we saw earlier, we can determine which of these 128 sets in the TLB corresponds to a target address. So 128 sets, so that gives you seven bits. So it gives you seven bits of the address. And for the remaining two bits, we use a different cache side channel 
that uses the fact that the memory management unit, when it's doing a page table walk, uses the same cache as regular processors. And um, it's using cache sets that are determined by bits in the virtual address, right? So it's doing a lookup in a page table using the bits in the virtual address. And so if you see which cache line gets indexed, you also know which bits were in that virtual address. So that gives us the, the remaining two bits. Together, we break uh, kernel address space layout randomization. And then we combine that, again, sequentially with a traditional memory error um, uh, exploit for the end-to-end -end exploit. Now, now, I don't want to go into this uh, in a, with more detail. This was perhaps already too much detail. Uh, if you're curious about this, ask. I have some backup slides on this also. What is interesting, perhaps, uh, and, and anecdotally interesting to, to mention, is that these tagged TLBs that were uh, used in the attack are absolutely essential for kernel page stable isolation, which is the uh, essential, one of the essential defenses against uh, the meltdown attack. Okay, but they were never, the, the, you know, the uh, um, uh, uh, KPTI was never uh, designed for this to begin with. So the original Kaiser patch was designed to protect kernel address space layout randomization. It completely isolates kernel and user space, but now. Because of these, if, if you're you know, curious about this, have a look at the paper, but because of these tagged TLBs, uh, we can actually break this. And so the tagged TLBs are essential to implement kernel page table isolation efficiently. But at the same time, because we have these tagged TLBs, they actually remove some of the security that was the original raison d'etre of, uh, of the Kaiser patch that was uh, part of KPTR. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's just anecdotally. Uh, so basically what I'm saying is that we have sequential combinations, and in this case, we have something that we've used together to just break one thing. We break nine bits using two different attacks. The, um, the Perhaps the, the more interesting thing is the one that's coming next. So if you didn't fully understand the previous slide, eh, don't worry. Everything is totally fine. Ask me if you have any questions, and I will explain. What I really want to talk about is the next class of attack, of, of, of uh, combining attacks. And this is uh, perhaps even more complicated. So maybe I should, should have said, you know, don't worry about a thing yet. Um, because the last class of combining attacks is what I called, you know, a symbiotic combination of two threat models. In this case, we have two completely different threat models that reinforce each other. They help each other. Okay, so they make each other stronger, and they, they, you know this is much less common, I think, and it's uh, a, an example of that is the the blind side attack that we um, we present at uh, CCS 2020. So here we have two completely different threat models: speculative execution on the one hand, and uh, traditional memory corruption, traditional software exploitation on the other hand. And neither of these two can easily lead to exploitation on successful exploitation on a modern system. Okay. But if we combine them, it turns out that exploitation becomes really simple. So here we see that the combination of these two is greater, offers something that is greater than the sum of its parts, as I shall illustrate um, in the next few slides. Okay, so I haven't seen much of this, and uh, before I go on, I should mention that much of the credit should go to our PhD student, N.S. Guttas, who, um, who did much of the, uh, the heavy lifting here. Okay, so it combines two completely different threat models. One of them is speculative execution. So consider Spectre, which is a, a, a speculative execution attack, and it made major headlines in 2018. And for some reason, it has a logo. I don't understand, so it's silly to have logos for vulnerabilities, but there you go. It's still a very serious vulnerability that has still not been completely solved today. There are many different variants of the, uh, the Spectre attack, and one of the variants is one that we see here, where we jump or call to a calculated address. Okay, so we we go to some address that needs to be calculated, and at some point, 
the CPU doesn't really know the outcome yet. It doesn't know where we're going to jump to. But it speculates on the outcome, right? So maybe the previous uh, uh, few times it, it, uh, it jumped to a particular address, and it's going to assume that it will jump to that particular address again. Okay. So it starts executing instructions there before it even knows whether this is the right address to continue execution. And if the speculation turned out to be incorrect, it will undo all of the architecturally visible effects. What the attacker can, so, so um, there's actually, it, it will appear architecturally as if this speculatively executed code has never been executed. And what the attacker can do is try to force this prediction. It can, you know, the attacker can try to train the predictor to jump to a particular target in the attacker's own code so that it will speculate that this is also the, going to be the outcome in, um, in some other code, in the, the victim's code also. Okay, so that's what the, um, uh, the attack is, is essentially all about. Okay. In fact, in the blind side uh, attack, we made use of two of the Spectre variants. In Spectre, uh, so the, the one at the bottom is the one that, that we saw earlier, right? So this is the uh, call or jump to some calculated address and we cause a misprediction so that it, uh, it you know, goes to some, some target that the attacker controls. But we also use um, uh, something that, or at least, you know, uh, use part of that, something that's known as factor variant one. And here we see that there is an, um, an array one that is indexed with index that is first checked to see if it's actually in bounds. Only if it is in bounds, the code accesses the array element and uh, stores that in you know, data in this particular case. And then it uses data as an index in a second array, array two. Now, this code may also be executed speculatively. For instance, if the last 10 times that we executed this, the index was it's less than bounds, so it was in bounds. The CPU will speculate that it will be in bounds again and start executing this code, even if the 11th time we provided a value that is not in bounds. In other words, the CPU will now speculatively read values from memory that it is not allowed to access. In principle, that should not be a problem because it does. Uh, not commit the results of this speculatively executed code until it knows that the speculation was correct. If it wasn't correct, it will squash the architectural, arch architecturally visible um, uh, results. However, there are also traces at the microarchitecture, so below the architecturally visible uh, level. Okay. So, for this, to show this, we're going to use a cache side channel again. Let us focus on this array two that we see here. And uh, let's assume just for simplicity's sake that the attacker also has access to this array two. The attacker makes sure that none of the elements of array two are currently in the cache. So you just access a lot of other memory. So none of the, uh, the elements of array two are currently in the cache. So that if we start reading elements from this uh, table, from this array, and we time the accesses, they will all be slow, right? Because they're not in the cache. They have to be obtained from main memory. Okay, now, if um, the code speculative, so this, all of this is slow. Now, if the, um, if the code speculatively executes this, uh, these instructions here, and uh, let's uh, say that, that we find at the a location indicated by uh, the offset from the array um, by index, the value that it finds there is a byte of a value two, then this means that this byte will be accessed here. Okay, so the value that we find in data is two, and then we use that as an index in array two. And that means that this value in array two will be in the cache. Okay. This value is used to read an element from array two. So this value, this element will now be in the cache. And if the attacker again accesses all of the elements in array two, she will find that you know element zero is slow and element one is slow, but element two 
is fast because it's in the cache and all the other elements are slow again. So since the attacker can see that this, it's element number two that is fast, it, she knows that the value was the secret value was two. Okay. So that's the specter vulnerability. Unfortunately for the attacker, current mitigations make specter attacks extremely hard. For instance, we have um, software mitigations such as red polines and hardware mitigations that make it very difficult to have a poisoned indirect call um, used to direct the control flow. So to have some you know, poisoned um, uh, predictor value to determine the, uh, the control flow. And you know, likewise, we, you know, modern code uses pointer or index masking to make it very difficult to do the out of bounds attacks and you know, there's a bunch of other things. So specter attacks on modern systems are very, very difficult. Okay. What about um, the traditional software exploitation? We probably all know about buffer overflows and other memory errors where a program reads data and you know, forgets to check whether or not the data that it reads actually fits in the buffer. And if, it, uh, if the attacker provides more data, it will overflow some value in memory that contains, let's say, a code point. Right, so return address or function pointer or so. And that means that the attacker can determine where the program is going to jump to. Unfortunately for the attacker, a memory corruption is no longer enough to compromise a system. Nowadays, code injection attacks are stopped by the annex bit uh, or you know, data execution prevention or whatever you want to call it. So we have to reuse code that is already in the binary. And this is also complicated because of moving target defenses, randomization, and especially if this randomization is fine-grained, more fine-grained than we, we currently have. And maybe if other defenses are applied also, for instance, execute only memory and so on. It means that if we, um, we try to jump somewhere um, that is you know, not a valid code address, we may crash. So in many of these places, we will actually crash. Okay, so that's what blind attacks are all about. So blind attacks try to, um, uh, you know, exploit the system without knowing the uh, the address space layout randomization. So blind attacks are, I think, they're super cool. They assume that you can corrupt a code pointer, but you have no information leak. Instead, you just jump around, right? So you jump around, and most of the time, you know, when you jump, this will lead to a crash, but not always. Right. For instance, sometimes it will not lead to a crash, but maybe it leads to a hang. Okay. So what blind code reuse attacks do is use these side effects, these crashes and hangs and other effects, to infer what code must have executed. And in this way, it eventually pinpoints specific gadgets. But of course, you can only do this if you can happily jump around here and um, not worry about this crash. So only if your code is crash resistant. For instance, this is the case in uh, some web servers, right? So web servers that have child processors, and it doesn't matter if the child crashes because the web server will automatically uh, fork a new child process and uh, it will continue running. This is the crash resistance. Um, and, um, and so you create thousands or tens of thousands of crashes, and it doesn't matter. Now, this is a very specific class of programs that are vulnerable to this sort of thing, and it's definitely not applicable to the kernel, where even a single wrong guess about where you, uh, you jump to uh, will lead to a crash. So the question is, what happens if we combine these traditional software exploitation uh, this traditional software exploitation and these speculative execution attacks. And in the blindside attack, we use a memory error to modify a code point, but we make sure that it is used speculatively. Okay, so we modify the actual code pointer, so we just override a function pointer perhaps, and not some value that is determined by a predictor, none of these specter mitigations work. Okay. So we use a memory error to set the jump target. And even though we corrupted it, it is, as far as speculative execution is concerned, the right jump target. 
And since this is executed speculatively, we don't have any crashes. Okay, so we can jump around freely without any crashes because the crashes we, uh, would be weird if we crashed during speculative execution, right? So, so we, uh, the speculative execution suppresses all the crashes. So now what we can do is freely jump around and again, look for side effects and find code pages and data pages and maybe specific gadgets such as the Spectre gadgets. And with that, we can reveal everything, the, all the code and all the data that is in the kernel of the operating system. So what we really do is if we go back to our original Spectre gadget. So here's the, um, the, the second gadget. He's the first gadget. Okay. So we don't use any of these, but we, we use a slightly different one. So it's a combination of these two, where we have an if condition, a slow condition that um, we only need, we don't actually need targets or anything. We just need this to start speculative execution. And then we have an indirect call, which calls the pointer that we corrupted with a normal memory error. Okay. So you may ask, you know, is this actually common to have these kind of code snippets? You know, something it, it doesn't have to be directly following the uh, the if condition, but close to it. Well, yeah, that's super common actually. It's much more common perhaps than the uh, the other gadgets, um, because uh, you know uh, many of the indirect branches that we see are dependent on a conditional branch within just a few instructions. So 50% of all the indirect branches are dependent on a conditional branch within 50 instructions, and uh, I don't know 37% of all the indirect branches are within a distance of just five instructions. So they're almost immediately following this conditional branch. So that's quite common. Now, what I said, what we're going to do is under speculative execution, we're going to jump around and then look for side effects. But what sort of side effects are we looking for? Well, in this particular case, we're looking for side effects in the cache. So, Here's an example. Let's say we look for a code page, a, a page that contains code. We don't care what's on it, but if we have a maybe coarse grained um, kernel address space layout randomization, we just want to know whether something is a code page. Well, what we do in that case is we corrupt the function pointer with, with um, uh, some some value, some guess for uh, uh, an address that uh, that con hopefully contains code. And if it's not a code page, you get a fault, but it doesn't matter because you're executing speculatively, so the crash will be suppressed. And if you do happen to land on a code page, the cache line for that target address will be filled. So, and we can test, because we, know, we actually provide this address, we can test this cache set to see if there's activity in that cache set. Okay, so now we know that this is a code page. But we can do much more complicated things also. And I just want to illustrate. So by the way, this is enough to break kernel address space layout randomization today. We can just you know, cycle through the code. Once we have a code page, we can cycle through until we reach the beginning of the, uh, the kernel uh, image and also the end of the kernel image. So we have all of the, um, uh, the, the randomization broken. But we can look for more complicated gadgets also. And I just want to emphasize that we look for gadgets that announce their presence using easily identifiable uh, signals. For instance, we try to target a gadget, a gadget that dereferences a pointer that, it, that the attacker controls, that we control. Okay, and then we check if the corresponding cache set gets activated. That's also what we did on the previous slide. And that's what we're going to do again on this slide. And here we see how we could find a hypothetical Spectre gadget. So let's say there is something, and we made it super simple, it contains four instructions for illustration purposes. And this is essentially uh, a Spectre gadget. We access a variable A from memory and, um, and use that as you know, a memory and address. So we uh, read some value in memory with, um, with whatever uh, address that we that we put. Okay, so we do that in line two. 
we use it as a memory address in line two. And then in line three, we um, read another value for memory, and that is the base of an array. And then in line four, we access an element in this array from this base, in other words, that is determined by the value that we read earlier. Okay, so the value that we read in line two here. Now, how do we detect this? Well, we corrupt not just this function pointer, but we also corrupt other values, maybe some other values in the same object or so. Okay, so um, uh, we corrupt A and B also. And since we um, we actually know the, uh, we, we fill in the, 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 the base of the array, so we control this, we need to also add some known value that is used as the index. So what we do here is we use a data page with known data. For instance, the page that sits between the, um, the kernel image and the um, uh, kernel heap and, and um, uh, sysmap, right? So that, is, that contains known data. So we can pick a known value there, and then we know exactly which address in memory is going to be referenced, and therefore on which cache set we should see activity. Okay. So we pick B, we know V, which means that we know exactly which cache, cache set will be accessed. And then we find this spectral gadget. And once we have a spectral gadget, we can use that to read any value from memory. Okay. Um, so this will leak anything in the kernel. And we can find, I don't know, data pages also, uh, maybe using a gadget such as this one, where we um, uh, corrupt a function pointer and also a pointer that is used as an index. So this P1 is used as an index into memory. Okay, so we know exactly which page will be accessed, and uh, sorry, this, which address will be accessed and which cache set, in other words, uh, should be uh, seeing some activity. Okay, so in other words, we're able to, you know, determine everything that is in the kernel, code, data, anything at all. Okay. So here's the uh, one, one important slide, right? So here's an important slide. What we see here is that we have generalized the speculative execution attacks using traditional memory corruption. We generalized it because we no longer need to use the wrong prediction for the target. But at the same time, Spectre also generalized the memory corruption attacks because now we can probe or jump to jump around without worrying about any crashes because we're doing this speculatively and all crashes are suppressed. So both of them get stronger. And what I would say is that the combination is greater than the sum of its parts. Okay. And I want to you know, move towards the end by giving you a short demo of one of these uh, these attacks. Let's see if this works. OK, so here we are. This is the machine of NS and uh, NS's uh, proof of concept, which he executes. And what it will do is first it finds a bunch of the last level cache eviction sets, because that's what we use. And then it's going to find uh, the kernel address space, and it's going to find uh, the um, um, the, the data pages. Okay, so let me move on a little bit. So here it's now going to probe for the kernel base address, and it's found it. And then it's going to probe for the heap base address. So then we have code and data. Okay, great. And um, let's see, it will find this at some point. So now it found the heap base address also. I'm just moving it forward a little bit to, otherwise we're going to run out of time. And um, next thing we're going to do is we're going to look for a vulnerable buffer location where we have our um, ROP code um, um, present. Okay, so so this is uh, uh, taking a little bit longer. It's probing. You can see the uh, the timer running here. And let's see. I don't know. At some point, it will be done. No, happily going. And here we go. So after some time, it will find this vulnerable buffer location, and then it will start executing the code, trigger the rock chain, 
and at some point we are root. And sure enough, if we now type who am I, it turns out that we are root. Okay, great. So this is an example of one of these attacks. So I just want to emphasize what we've seen. We had a normal user, NS. We uh, run some proof of concept here. It finds eviction sets. Then it looks for the kernel image. It looks for uh, data pages. And then it looks for the uh, page that contains the ROP payload. And then we get root. To conclude, and I think this is roughly the time where I have to conclude. What we've seen so far is that the abstractions and certainly the layered abstractions that we have to use to make all of this complex mess understandable and tractable are to some extent both harmful and necessary. They're necessary because otherwise we cannot make sense of this world, but they're also harmful because there are things going on in this mess that we need to be aware of. We need to be aware of that, uh, the fact that you know, uh, there are cache side channels and therefore we have to make our, I don't know, our code constant time. Okay? So that is now on the application, but it's not just the cache, it's also DRAM, it's also operating system functionality, it's vulnerabilities, physical attacks, all sorts of other things. And to write uh, really secure code, you kind of need to know everything about everything. And that is of course not possible. It's a mistake to you know, think about these threat models in pure isolation. You have to be aware of this fact that attackers don't care about particular threat models and they will combine anything with anything if it so suits them. And if you do that, you might actually create some Frankenstein monster that is greater than the sum of its parts. So in the end, I would say the um, uh, quarrelsome youth from the beginning of the presentation may have had a point when he said, you know, it's all just a lot of stuff and the attacker can use anything that the attacker wants. So if you want to know more about any particular um, attack that I've alluded to, some of the combinations that I've talked about, you know, ask me or go to our website, fusac.net, where most of these projects are described and, you know, the papers are also present. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Or, um, or just ask me right after this, uh, this presentation. And I think I'm still you know, some two minutes uh, ahead of schedule, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the nice talk. We get one round of applause. Um, Fantastic. <laughs> so we have some questions in the chat. People can feel free to ask some more questions in the chat. Uh, so I'll start with uh, Matthias Payer. Uh, from EPFL, he says he loved the path towards realistic, exp realistically exploiting side channels as part of an exploit chain. Many side channels rely on low noise environments. How will this scale to busier systems, i.e. how re resilient are these attacks against noise? Right, so noise, of course, is, is always one of the, uh, the, uh, the things that make side channel attacks more complicated. But in the end, it's just statistics, right? So you, you can repeat these things, um, and uh, and and then uh, you know I think all, all the noise you can probably uh, 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 handle. So for instance, in the blind side attack, right? So there's some noise where um, we pick an address of uh, a cache set, and we typically try to use a relatively quiescent cache set uh, and, uh, if we can to measure activity. But of course, there could be some activity from you know, some other code that also accesses the, uh, the access, and then we get you know, some noise that we need to deal with. But we can reduce that noise by, for instance, picking um, uh, an, a few other addresses to verify this, right? So we can verify the value that we found to see whether or not if we can also create artificially uh, create activity in other cache sets, we get rid of that, uh, that noise. We can verify whether or not it was a false positive, so you know, some noisy uh, result or something that was real. I hope that answers the question, Matthias. Okay, so Asta Meta has a follow-up question. How far are we from seeing real side channel leaks in real world settings, for example, in cloud tenants? Uh, are you sure you haven't seen them yet? Oh, well, you haven't seen them, but are you sure they're not there yet? I'm, I'm not, I, this is always hard to, um, to answer, right? So 
we've shown in the past that uh, it's possible to um, uh, compromise you know, virtual machines that are uh, co-located on the same hardware. Whether or not this is something that is actively being used, I don't know. I also um, uh, think you, know, you have to you know, maybe deal with more noisy situations there, but there's nothing to stop you from doing this, except that you know, maybe there are more you know, trivial bugs that you can exploit um, unless you're, um, you're attacking something that is uh, really high value uh, and uh, extremely well protected. Maybe there are easier ways to do that. Okay. Uh, the next question is um, from Spiridula Gravani. Uh, were you enforcing the effects of one attack with another? It's very interesting. Regarding blind specter attacks on the kernel, could software defenses such as control flow integrity enforcement still cause the kernel to crash before the speculative execution gives useful information to the attacker? In other words, couldn't such software defenses bring back some of the properties such as not being crash resistant? Um, it's difficult, right? So you would have to then apply this control flow integrity on this speculative path also, because otherwise, you know, you, you don't actually, you don't actually crash, right? So you, uh, you, you, you run it speculatively. So, uh, so there, there is no crash. You could maybe try to detect that something is, uh, you know, out of the ordinary there. Oh, we, oh wait, wait a minute. You, you mean after, um, I guess what you're saying is after you've, uh, found this um, um, uh, this gadget. Can you prevent the um, uh, the, the control transfer uh, at at that point? Yeah, I think that, that yeah that is something that you could explore. Um, but as we know, so it will reduce the attack surface for the uh, for the attacker, but it doesn't actually stop the attack, right? So you don't necessarily need to divert the control flow to begin with, right? So if you find out where I don't know the um, uh, the privilege level of this particular user is, right? So cred, then you can modify that and you're also done. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Conrad Reek. I'm wondering whether the problem of threat models that you described is actually rooted in an incomplete defenses and not necessarily in abstraction. If a defense completely eliminates a threat, Neither symbiotic nor concurrent sequential attacks would succeed. What's your take on this? Yeah, so um, if, if we knew all the possible threats and we would root them all out, then of course this is the, the, um, uh, a perfectly um, impossible system to, uh, to use with the, these kind of attacks. But I think that is really difficult, right? So we have all of these resources that are used inherently, right? So there's uh, your memory management use, unit will use the cache, right? And it will use uh, TLB and it will use all sorts of other things. So if we can design systems differently, I think you you would be absolutely right. But I think it's very difficult. I, you know, I would have to think about whether or not it's possible with today's systems. I would, no, not with today's systems. Not with today's systems, I think. Um, but you could definitely uh, design systems that uh, with you know great difficulty, uh, you could divide, design systems that could remove these uh, these kind of threats, and then you can no longer combine them either. Okay, a uh, question from Andrew Bauman: Is all hope lost for abstractions? Do you see a path back to systems that provide stable and secure abstractions, or is the future really that the developer must know everything, which doesn't sound like very viable? Yeah, so that's so that, that is kind of the conundrum, right? So I don't think this is a, a, a possibility, right? You cannot know everything, and I, I think this is the um, the task that we should set ourselves as researchers to design these systems, and that means from the ground up we have to think about you know the kind of abstractions that we provide to the layers above, um, and to make sure that uh, there's you know full control over some of these things, right? So so I think I'm I'm very um, um, uh, inspired by the uh, by the the work that is done on you know new hardware software um, contracts right so where we try to get you know either more control over what's happening at the the lowest level of the boundaries you still have other things that are still uh, left out of scope currently such as DRAM we don't 
you know, talk about uh, the, the, the Rowhammer vulnerability there. But, but this is, I think, what we need to do, design this from the, the ground up and have abstractions that are, you know, uh, at least for all of the resources that we know might lead to interference, might lead to side channels, uh, can be controlled so that we can, you know, nuke these, these side channels whenever we do something sensitive. I hope that answers Andrew's question. OK, uh, next question is from Matthias Payer again. Um, we seem to be in an era where there is extreme excitement for microarchitectural side channels and several new side channels pop up at each guys. conference. Do you hear me? Hello? Herbert? I'm no longer hearing anything. Is there a connectivity problem? Uh, does anyone else hear me? I hear both Herbert and you. Herbert was lost for a little while, but he seems back now. OK, now I can hear you guys again. OK. That's good. Um, so uh, Matthias asks, we seem to be an era where there's extreme excitement for microarchitectural side channels and several new side new channels uh, pop up at each conference. What are your thoughts regarding the future of microarchitectural vulnerabilities versus classic software vulnerabilities? Which ones are more exploitable? Will microarchitectural attacks just become another tool in the attacker's tool set? Yeah, I think it's the latter actually. There's, I think this is super hot right now. Uh, can you? Still hear me, Julia, just to make yes. sure. Okay. Yes, everything's fine. So I think this is super hot right now, and we're exploring this. And, and you know, these new side channels uh, uh, pop up and hardware vulnerabilities pop up because we've just started looking, right? So we've start, we've, we're have we in the same wave that we were in uh, in the, um, you know, around, the, you know, early 2000s, where we started looking at, you know, buffer overflows and, and other kind of memory corruption attacks, super cool stuff. I think that's what we're seeing now. So we're finding a lot. And I think in the end, this is going to be just one, like I said, one box of stuff that the attacker can use. And, and we're seeing this already, right? So we're seeing some of the um, uh, the exploits that uh, that have been published by Google Zero. They use traditional uh, memory corruption and they use, uh, you know, some, uh, some speculative execution attack. So they used the MDS riddle uh, attack um, and, uh, and and we're doing the same thing with, with blindsight, right? Where we use different uh, uh, classes of attack, so speculative execution and traditional kernels. It's all part of the toolbox of the attacker. Yeah, I think that's exactly what we're going to see. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Anil Kurmus. A very entertaining and instructive talk. Blindsight is a very clever attack, but requires a very powerful fairly powerful memory con uh, corruption vulnerability by assumption. For the kernel vulnerability that you have used, have you checked whether it could be augmented by to bypass ASLR using traditional known techniques, for instance, by simply overwriting a length value used in a read access and leaking kernel data? Yeah, so we did have a, have a look at this. We could not find anything uh, you know, out, of the, out of the box. And I, I, you know, I'm not going to claim that it's not possible, but we uh, we could not find it. Uh, but you, you're right. So you you need to have some memory corruption attack. But memory corruption attacks by themselves are you know, still a long way away from actually getting full um, uh, code execution or you know root access. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, next so question. Uh, but I, I I I yeah maybe I should I should say a few more words about this. So it's uh, definitely the case that with memory corruption attacks, such as, you know, uh, if you have an arbitrary um, write primitive, arbitrary write primitive so that you can write anywhere in memory, then it may well be possible to, um, to elevate that to something that also reads um, addresses. Okay. So, but there, there's still, you know, uh, the problem of, is this enough to bypass advanced defenses? So not just the uh, the kernel address space layout randomization that we have today, but also you know super fine grained randomization, right? Maybe at the function level or the basic block level or so. Um, and um, and what if we combine that with um, execute only memory and 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 so on? So 
it's it's unclear whether you can do this uh, for the majority of the memory corruption attacks that we uh, that we have uh, even today. Okay. Next question is from Nicola Dragoni. Uh, concrete action as a next step to solve, or what is some concrete action that can be taken as a next step to solve the problem? Also, considering that most IT people, people do not have a security background, the you must know everything is not really realistic. Should we rethink security from scratch? Yeah, so the it is you know deliberately provocative, right? So the uh, you must know everything is it's it's a doom scenario, right? So this is the the worst thing that you can you can uh, demand from uh, from an application developer. So, but yeah, I think what we need to do is really carefully, re as Andrew was saying, right? So we need to to uh, carefully rethink the abstractions that we provide to higher layers. And I'm not sure whether we can ever uh, get this. Right, but we can definitely do a much much better job than uh, than what we're doing there. But I think that starts at a, a much lower level than just you know adding some hard, uh, software hardening defense to kernel code or some extra moving target defense to your to your operating system or your your, your binary. Um, it it goes much deeper than that, and you need to know about these things and think about these things and make sure that there is no leak as possible. But it's difficult because some of these things are not inherent to the um, uh, the lower layers of the, uh, the system that you're depending on. It's actually inherent on the lower la layers of the system that you're depending on in combination of the code that you're executing. And maybe there is something there that, uh, that you know, we didn't think about yet, but can lead to uh, some, some side channel that, uh, that is hard to eradicate. But I think that's that's you know the level that we're starting. So I think there's you know a lot, a lot of interesting work currently being done, and uh, you know new processor architectures, which uh, I believe is uh, is going to be super interesting in years to come. So do you think we should just we need to rewrite the operating system or reorganize the operating system, or as you said at the end, are we going to just hope that the architectures will help us and or get rid of their problems, and then we can just move on in a normal way? What do you? But so I think the operating systems also, yes, they need to change. So so both the operating systems and you know the layers that on, on which they depend, and the, you know maybe the layers that uh, that 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 rely on that operating system. I think it's going to be a lot of work throughout the uh, the software stack, and the question is whether we can ever fully get this right. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is from Bjorn Rutenberg. What do you think might be causing vendors to use one threat model for vulnerable technology and using a different threat model for another when the vendor uh, owns both technologies? These reside physically, physically next to each other and both lead to ring zero compromise. For example, UEFI residing in an SPI flash and other firmware physically residing in an SPI flash next to it. Uh... I don't know what to answer to that question. <laughs> uh, I'll pass on that one. Sorry. OK. So Bjorn, if you're out there, if you have some follow up, please just type in the chat. Um, yeah, yeah, elaborate uh, if, if you want, so then, then maybe I can I can comment. Uh, do you think there is a practical? This is from G. Ju. Do you think there's a practical pure software cure for current side channel attacks without architectural changes, such as enhancing systems programming languages specifically to mitigate side channel problems? I don't think so. I think so. Some of the um, well, it depends uh, on on. Uh, it still depends on the hardware, right? So the hardware needs to provide enough of. Um, uh, 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 of a handle to you know nuke certain data that is hidden deep in the uh, in in the uh, the buffers and channels that are in the processor. So the pipes are full of of, uh, of data, and you need to have at least some control over that to make sure that nothing can leak via speculation or some other way um, to uh, to handle that. The same, perhaps. So I'm not entirely sure whether the same is true for memory uh, chips. Right, so the uh, the DRAM chips are vulnerable to row hammer. Well, you yes, you could in principle um, protect that, protect against uh, row hammer vulnerabilities by not using all of the uh, the memory that's on the chip. You know, just throw away half of your memory, and um, then you know you can flip bits in the neighboring rows, and nobody cares, right? Because they're not being used. 
we have a, you know, if you're interested in that, we had a, a paper on how you can do that and make it a little bit more efficient than that um, in, um, in um, uh, the Gibran paper that we, uh, we published at, uh, was it OGI? I forgot. Oh, Zebra. Okay, there's a, talk for, a question from Daniele Cono Delia. Um, brilliant talk. Following up on the previous questions for classic software vulnerabilities, we saw how helpful can be a, co a cooperation uh, between compilers, such as with Canaries, CFI, and so on, and hardware vendors, and XBit, executable only memory, in hindering classes of remote code execution attacks. What do you expect for microarchitectural attacks? Um, as in, do do I see the okay, can the uh, compiler work together with the hardware somehow? Um, yeah, so there are certain things that you can uh, you can do at the uh, the compiler level, but it's it's so for all of these microarchitectural attacks, it's uh, it's it's very difficult to uh, to answer that in uh, in a general sense. Um, some of these things you can definitely help with uh, uh, by by you know placing boundaries on speculation, right? Adding a, an instruction that stops speculation. That's exactly what is happening currently, right? So there's a mitigation such as uh, the, the repolene uh, uh, mitigation that is uh, stopping some of the speculative execution, some of the specter variants are exactly you know essentially compiler technology. You're adding a, a number of extra. Uh, instructions there to make sure that the speculation, while it still occurs, we don't stop the speculation, but it no longer causes any harm. So yeah, I think there's a, a lot of fruitful research that we can do there to uh, to try and mitigate this. Okay, so a follow up from Bjorn on the previous question. Uh, so to elaborate on my previous question, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on causes for one vendor using different threat models for technologies they own. Uh, when the consequences ring zero compromise are the same and when the con technologies reside in the same system. Uh, can you repeat the question, Julia? Because uh... mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the causes for one vendor using different threat models for the technologies that they own. Ah, uh, I see. So, so you have one threat model for the, I don't know, uh, um, uh, the BIOS and then all the threat model for for something else. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't know. That's interesting. I I actually don't know. There's different teams. I, I suppose these are large companies, and uh, and you know uh, maybe this is uh, there's there may not even be a well thought out plan behind this. But uh, but honestly, I, I I don't really know. So me being an academic locked up in my ivory tower, I have little limited visibility over this. Okay. Um, but it is an interesting thing, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I do agree, and I'd be curious to find out. Okay. So I don't see any more questions in Teams. I don't know if there are questions in Slack. Uh, Nikhil? No, nothing from YouTube so far. Uh, sorry, I keep saying Slack. Uh, in YouTube, okay, so no questions. Um, so one thing I was wondering myself is, uh, so you've made a good argument that uh, it's threat models. It's kind of hard to uh, kind of hard to pin down what the. I mean, what is the future of research and security somehow? Um, if the researcher can't pin down what the threat models should be, how can we make any meaningful progress? Yeah, so I I, I agree, right? So we we can't come up with with new solutions if we don't target a particular class of vulnerabilities i think that is you know we have to be realistic there we um, uh, we we cannot avoid doing this we so we have to have uh, you know if we publish a new solution and we write about this we have to explicitly indicate that this is our threat model but we also constantly have to be aware of the fact that this threat model is, you know, assuming that a lot of stuff is not happening. And this may, we have to think about whether or not this is a realistic uh, way of, of looking at the world and whether or not uh, this, 
will will actually stop the attack if the attacker starts to shop around a little bit more, right? So so let's you know even even at the level of of regular code reuse attacks, so ROP return oriented programming attacks, what we've been doing in research for many years since you know the original paper was published by uh, so the attack the hacker community has been doing this uh, this for longer but the the first academic paper was published in uh, 2007 by uh, Hobart Shacham and um, what he showed in the paper is that you can use static analysis to find gadgets and then you know you can construct one of these rock chains now all of the solutions that came afterwards used that web model right so where we have static analysis to see if we can uh, can find these gadgets but in reality, there's no reason why an attacker should stick to static analysis. And it's, uh, um, some 10 years after the original paper, we published a paper that showed that even with super trivial dynamic analysis, you can bypass uh, most of these really advanced defenses, trivially, right, without any effort. So this was just a, uh, uh, the simplest kind of dynamic analysis, paint analysis that we threw at this and we would find all the gadgets that we needed to um, to uh, uh, launch uh, 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 attacks that, that lead to full compromise. So we constantly have to think about, is this actually the, the threat model that an attacker would stick to? I think that's what we need to do. And it's, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be aware of this fundamental problem that the attacker doesn't care about your threat model. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any further questions? Have I missed any questions? Okay. So thank you for the very nice talk. Thanks everyone for attending. Uh, and remember, there will be another talk tomorrow. It, tomorrow's will be a panel. Um, so uh, same time, same same team address or something like that. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.